Where did the strange and terrifying behavior begin? Although there's no certain answer, some think the paintings of the Middle Ages provide a clue. In medieval art, the mouth of hell is so often depicted as the mouth of a great monster with flames inside it and the damned uh, dropping down the monster's throat into the flame. So it seems natural that there is an association between uh, hellfire and dragon fire so far as Christian dragons are concerned. Images of dragons flooded the medieval world. They appeared in folk art, popular legends, and illuminated manuscripts. But of all the dragon images, none is more incongruous than the gargoyle. How did the monstrous dragon come to guard the very house of God? It's fascinating to consider that at the same time the church is slaying dragons, trying to put down old religions perhaps, or control sexuality, at the same time it flings open the doors of its cathedrals and asks the dragons in in the form of gargoyles. It's really quite mysterious to, to wonder how they get from the dragon as evil to the dragon as the protector of the cathedral. According to legend, it all started in medieval France in the city of Rouen. One morning, a monstrous water dragon emerged, vile and slime covered from the Seine River. The beast surveyed the city. Then, from its gaping mouth, it spewed a torrent of water. The townspeople called him the Gargler, and all fled before it, fearing a watery death. All that is except the archbishop. He confronted the beast with the sign of a cross. Instantly, the water dragon sank down, its fury extinguished. From that day on, the drain spouts of the cathedral were carved to depict the gargler. We call them gargoyles. By the early 17th century, the dawn of the Age of Reason, European dragons began to drift back into the shadows of myth. Yet dragon legends were far from extinct. Chinese dragons. They dominate architecture, fabric, and ceramics. Since dragons are thought to bring good fortune, they've long been honored in ancient folk festivals and traditional New Year celebrations. For thousands of years, Chinese dragons have been sacred symbols of change, able to make themselves as small as silkworms, or large enough to fill the space between heaven and earth. Even more remarkably, dragons were thought to govern the essential rhythms of Chinese society. Ancient tradition says that dragons water the rice fields, providing the cornerstone of Chinese civilization. Yet, Chinese dragons have a destructive side, too. They're also thought to deliver the devastating storms that regularly batter China's shores. 
Why would the life-giving dragon release such deadly tempests? What affront could humans have committed to merit this punishment? In fact, according to Chinese folklore, mortal behavior has nothing to do with it. Peasants tell stories of dragon kings, noble animals that live in aquatic palaces on the ocean floor. In the spring, dragons ascend to the heavens. In the autumn, they return to their undersea homes. These seasonal passages are said to stir up China's destructive storms. Far from the tempests of everyday life stands China's forbidden city, the emperor's exclusive palace. It is adorned with dragons. Why? How was this idol of the peasantry welcomed into the royal household? Thousands of years ago, a lowly soldier of fortune named Liu Pang rose to the pinnacle of Chinese society. He was poised to become emperor, the son of heaven. But Liu Pang had a problem. His common origins did not bode well in tradition-bound China. The founder of a great dynasty needed a great lineage. So, Liu Pang invented one. He claimed to descend from dragons. When Liu Bang and his associates took power, they felt the need to justify, to legitimize this new dynasty and to upgrade Liu Bang's nobility. Therefore, they give this new component of dragon mythology. And from that day onward, the dragon become the symbol of imperial power. Curiously, the emperor's dragon was always depicted with five claws. This creature became so wedded to the imperial identity that before long, every feature of the Chinese court was described in terms of dragons. The emperor was called the true dragon. He sat on the dragon throne and wrapped himself in dragon robes. So jealously did the royal household guard its five-clawed dragon that anyone who displayed the symbol without approval was punished by death. Why did Chinese dragons become civilized, even regal, while their Western cousins remained marauding brutes. My best guess for why Chinese dragons are different from Western dragons has to do probably with the way that the two cultures regard nature. We in the West have tended to regard nature as something to be conquered and overmastered by force. Whereas the Chinese, on the other hand, tend to be much more in accord with nature. Some experts object to comparisons between Eastern and Western dragons. China's dragon mythology may have developed 6,000 years ago, long before dragon stories emerged in the West. Chinese and Western dragons act differently, these scholars say, because they are totally unrelated. We have to start at the very basic question that the Chinese dragon and the Western dragon are not the same thing. The Chinese, because by using the very English term, the English word dragon, we have uh, a wrong impression that dragons all over the world are the same in nature. In fact, they are not. 
Perhaps cultural attitudes towards nature are less important than nature itself. Might eastern dragons be unique because they're based on eastern animals? And if so, might other continents harbor different creatures? It was August 1675. The French missionary, Father Jacques Marquette, and a group of explorers were canoeing down the Mississippi River. As they rounded a bend, the men fell into the shadow of a tall cliff. They cast their gaze upwards. There, the astonished party beheld two monstrous dragons painted on the limestone rocks. The picture, according to their Indian guide, had been painted hundreds of years earlier. It depicted a monster called Piasa, a huge winged animal said to devour humans. How could this creature of ancient American folklore look and act so much like the dragons of Europe? What can explain the baffling similarities between old and new world dragons? And that's quite a mystery to us. Are the people there thinking of them on their own, or have they had some sort of contact with the cultures of the old world? The Piasa wasn't the only dragon-like beast of the new world. Other European explorers reported myths throughout the Americas featuring snakes with horns or wings. The most striking New World dragon of all, however, arose further south in the land of the Aztecs. These are the pyramids of Teotihuacan, standing just 25 miles outside Mexico City. It was here that Aztec priests worshipped their gods and practiced human sacrifice. The monuments at Teotihuacan are carved with deities, shells, and a dragon called Quetzalcoatl. Where did he come from? Why does a dragon adorn one of the most sacred sites of Aztec civilization? The answer begins with a strange paradox. While dragons of the old world were monstrous demons, the Aztec dragon was a god. Far from threatening civilization, the dragon Quetzalcoatl was revered for founding it. According to Aztec legend, Quetzalcoatl launched Aztec culture. He brought writing and agriculture to the land that is now Mexico. Ironically, the dragon Quetzalcoatl also played a role in the destruction of Aztec life. How did it happen? What odd twist of events converted the dragon god, Quetzalcoatl, into the angel of death for the mighty Aztec Empire? Tradition held that Quetzalcoatl once actually governed the land of the Aztecs in the form of a man. The mortal Quetzalcoatl had light skin and hair. One day, stalked by enemies, he fled his native land. As he departed, Quetzalcoatl vowed to return. Hundreds of years later, in 1519, that promise seemed fulfilled. 